Hi, my name is Alan Jeremias, and I'm an interventional cardiologist at Stony Brook University Medical Center, and I will present a case of multivessel CAD and the clinical approach of that. The case we're going to discuss today is that of a 64-year-old male with new onset chest pain, which actually is worsening over the past week. He has a significant medical history of diabetes, hypertension, is morbidly obese, and also has a strong family history of premature CAD. He was admitted to the hospital, ruled out for an acute MI by EKG and troponin, and had an echocardiogram done which indicated a preserved ejection fraction. At that time, the decision was made to admit him for a cardiac catheterization over stress testing given his very high pretest probability of CAD. This is the coronary angiogram of the RCA showing moderate diffuse disease of the RCA proper and a about 70% osteal right PDA stenosis. The cranial view outlines this RPDA stenosis in a bit more detail. It appears to be somewhat more significant in this view, maybe up to 80%, um, and as, as one can see, it's relatively focal. This is the final angiogram of the RCA and it demonstrates that the area supplied by the PDA is relatively large. So in summary, the RCA has moderate diffuse disease with an 80% stenosis of the proximal RPDA, which is a relatively large vessel supplying the inferior wall. Coronary angiography of the left coronary system shows a short and patent uh, left main coronary artery there is also moderate diffuse disease in the left circumflex system with two st discrete stenosis in the OM1 and OM2, both around maybe 70 um, to 80 percent. In addition, there is also a 70 percent stenosis of the mid-LAD, which is a tubular lesion relatively long, um, again in the moderately diffused uh, LAD. So to recap this case, this is a 64-year-old male with a history of diabetes who has a preserved left ventricular function, now presenting with unstable angina, and he was found to have three-vessel disease on cardiac catheterization with moderate to severe lesions in the RPDA, OM1, OM2, and the mid-LAD. So the question now is, what is the best approach? And of course, one can proceed and do PCI to all of these lesions. Um, bypass, of course, is an option, in particular given the recent data from the Freedom trial. Uh, we could do nothing and treat the patient medically, at least initially, or one can also consider hemodynamic assessment of lesion severity with FFR to really figure out which of those lesions, um, if any, cause a problem in terms of ischemia. We decided to proceed with hemodynamic evaluation of all of these lesions, so multivessel FFR, and note the time at which we started the procedure. This is 1.30 p.m., and the first vessel evaluated was the LAD, which demonstrated a non-significant FFR of 0 0.88. Next, the wire was withdrawn for a pullback and re-equalized um, at the tip of the guide and then advanced into OM1 and the FFR of OM1 was 0.82, which also is consistent with a non-ischemia producing stenosis. And note the time, this is uh, five minutes later, so it's relatively quickly that this can be done. We also assessed OM2, um, again, by withdrawing the wire, re-equalizing, and then advancing it into OM2. So three minutes later, we have the result of that and it shows also a non-significant stenosis with an FFR of 0 0.83. We then changed guiding catheters and engaged the RCA with a JR4, advanced the wire um, into the PDA and recorded FFR there, and that in fact was significant hemodynamically with an FFR of 0 0.74. And if you pay attention to the time, it's about 25 minutes that we were able to perform FFR of four different lesions, all with IV adenosine. 
And at that point, the decision was relatively straightforward. We reduced uh, this patient's four-vessel disease really to one-vessel disease and then proceeded with PCI to the osteoproximal PDA with a good angiographic result. This case is a nice illustration of the FAME trial, which compared two different strategies in approximately 1,000 patients with multivessel CAD. Patients were randomized to angiographically guided PCI, where all lesions that appeared significant by the angiogram um, underwent PCI, versus uh, in hemodynamically guided PCI, where lesions underwent FFR, and then only those lesions were fixed that were, in fact, hemodynamically significant by FFR. And this is the one-year outcomes we're looking at, and as you can see, there is a significant reduction in the overall event rate, which was a combination of death MI and revascularization, by approximately 5%, which was um, significant from 18 to about 13% overall MACE rate. And when we further assess the outcome of those lesions that were deferred among the about 500 patients that had FFR assessments, we find that there were 513 lesions that were not significant by FFR and thus did not undergo PCI. At two years, there were 31 MIs in that group, 22 were periprocedural from other lesions that were um, treated during that same procedure. Of the nine late MIs that occurred, eight were due to either a new lesion or to the stent that was implanted. And so there was only one MI that occurred to an originally deferred lesion, which gives us an event rate of 0.2%, obviously very favorable in terms of long-term long outcomes. In a post hoc analysis, again, of that group that underwent FFR guidance, um, a syntax score was calculated uh, first based on the angiographic criteria, which is the real um, syntax score, and then there was a functional syntax score that was derived from the hemodynamic data by FFR. And as you see in this graph, um, a third of the patients actually moved to a lower risk group, such that from the original syntax score, um, the low, medium, and high risk patients were divided about equally a third in each group. After the hemodynamic assessment, 60% um, were in the low risk group, only 20% in the medium risk group, and 20% in the high risk group, which um, obviously changes therapies and many more patients can be treated either medically or with PCI rather than additional PCI or bypass surgery. So in conclusion, FFR guidance for patients with multivessel disease is feasible in routine clinical practice as illustrated in this case example. I believe greatly aids in clinical decision making, frequently changes therapy, and is associated with improved outcomes based on clinical trials.